Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the NetCDF Why and How Creating Publication Quality NetCDF Datasets Webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. It is 2 p.m. Eastern Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. What I'd like to do first is go over a few webinar logistics. To ensure the best audio experience, participants have been placed in silent mode, but if you have any issues or questions, please enter them into the Q&A pod. And again, you'll find that located on the right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. Today's event is being recorded. The recording will be posted to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog, as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. Once completed, what I'll do is I will send an email to all registrants with recording links. As far as timing is concerned, today's webinar will be one hour long, with 45 minutes allocated to the presentation and live demonstrations, and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. We will have two speakers during today's event. Michelle Thornton, who is the DayMet Production Lead at NASA's Oak Ridge National Laboratory Distributed Active Archive Center, or ORNL-DAC, and Jack McNeilis, a geospatial scientist at ORNL-DAC. Once our speakers have finished with their presentations, what we'll do then is we'll transition to a final optional set of polling questions. And usually I give these about three to four minutes or so. And then from there, we'll transition directly into the Q&A period. Depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes from end time for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. All right, right now we are going to pull up today's agenda. Okay, hopefully everybody can see the agenda. We will begin today's webinar with Michelle Thornton. She will discuss two topics. What advantages does NetCDF have that make it a suitable long-term archive and sharing format? And then second, how can you transform your data from other formats into standardized NetCDF files? From there, we will transition to our second speaker, Jack McNeilis, who will walk you through the NetCDF demonstration using Python and other command line utilities. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Michelle Thornton. Michelle? I'm muted, so I'm going to go ahead. Thank you, Jennifer, and hello to everyone out there. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Michelle Thornton, and I'll be presenting material today along with my colleague, Jack McNeilis. I would like to acknowledge some other colleagues for their assistance in putting material together today. Uh, Matt Donovan works on our ingest team and is responsible for reformatting and standardizing many NetCDF files distributed here at the DAC. And Dr. Yasheng Wei, who is here in the room with us today, he's our uh, geospatial information scientist and our main NetCDF CF compliance data server go-to person here at the ORNL DAC. Uh, like Jennifer said, we are all part of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory Distributed Active Archive Center here in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. A little bit about the DAC. The ORNL DAC is part of NASA's Earth Observing Data and Information System, or ESDIS. ESDIS DACs process, archive, document, and distribute data from NASA's past and current Earth Observing satellites and field measurement programs. As you can see from this slide, the ORNL DAC's mission is to assemble, distribute, and provide data services related to NASA's terrestrial, biogeochemistry, and ecological data and models. To that end, it's critical for us to standardize and format data for long-term curation, distribution, and data services. Now, for multidimensional or scientific data sets, we find the NetCDF file format to be critical to accomplish these objectives. In this webinar, we want to share some of our best practices, knowledge, tools, and methods to produce NetCDF files. This will be an introductory to intermediate level for NetCDF file formats and standards but a working knowledge of geospatial data and projections will be helpful. Briefly, we'll discuss why we as a DAC and why you as a data provider may choose NetCDF file format for appropriate data sets or services. And then we'll spend time sharing methods on how you can transform and standardize files to CF-compliant NetCDF format. 
We'll cover software and methods that we commonly use when working with NetCDF. Like Jennifer said, along with the webinar that she will post, the demonstrations that we will share today will be available on our DAC website under the Resources tab. Starting off with why NetCDF. First off, it's a NASA-approved and recommended format. And there's a link here on the slide that goes into more of that information. Secondly, NetCDF, which stands for Network Common Data Form, was created by UCAR's Unidata Program for Multidimensional Scientific Data. And it supports data access and sharing. As a file format, NetCDF continues to grow in popularity and usefulness and has become very widespread. Thirdly, this file format is important to our mission as a DAC to distribute and provide data services to our users. Consider one of the data sets that we here at the ORNL DAC distribute, a daily one kilometer gridded weather data set for North America. This is a moderate sized data set and most researchers do not want the entire spatial or temporal extent. A well-structured and well-defined NetCDF file can be queried and subset based on dimensions, typically space or time, allowing users the ability to download or programmatically access subsets of their study area of interest. So, because and finally, for users of NetCDF, the structure of the array and the ability to access files by index can improve data analysis and manipulation. You can look to our resources page for tutorials on how to access and manipulate NetCDF files. From a DAC perspective, having standardized multidimensional files allows us to best serve our community. From our data servers, the DAC can provide custom tools and services that provide easier access to subsets of data. A data, a data user can download entire data sets or subsets within a web browser and even automate those downloads. Or a user can program, programmatically query subsets of data and perform calculations directly through software such as Python or R. Finally, other services and scientists have access to our data and can, can create higher level applications to serve their community, fostering data sharing and open source applications. Now that you know why NetCDF, let's turn the discussion to the how of NetCDF. We're going to step through a common data set transformation that you may encounter, starting with the GeoTIFF file format. It's often the case that model or research outputs are in many, sometimes thousands, of individual GeoTIFF files. These are a great candidate for NetCDF file formats because they are essentially multidimensional. Jack and I will work through an example dataset transformation that was originally received at the ORNL DAC as thousands of separate GeoTIFF files. The data model output from a NASA project called the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, or ABOVE, was, was the file set that was given to the DAC. The DOI for this data set is on this slide. Looking at the original submission, it was model output in a GeoTIFF file format. There were individual bands for each day of data. Each file had two bands, a snow depth band and a snow density band, and there were five different spatial resolutions. In all, over 5,400 separate GeoTIFF files. After the data provider reorganized and reformatted the data set, the final data set distribution package dropped to just 40 individual files. This data set was a great example for conversion to a multidimensional NetCDF format. On the right is the table list of this data set distribution from the ORNL DAC. We'll be demonstrating the snow depth uh, 500 meter 2006 transformation from individual GeoTIFF files to NetCDF. Basically, the steps that we'll go through to transform this data from individual GeoTIFFs to one CF-compliant NetCDF are 
First of all, we'll extract the snow depth variable from each GeoTIFF file and convert the 365 GeoTIFF files to individual NetCDF files. Thirdly, we'll merge that, those individual NetCDFs into one three-dimensional file. And finally, standardize the CF compliance. Let's start by thinking about the structure of a GeoTIFF file. We know that a GeoTIFF file consists of rows and columns that define its size. Individual files can represent a time or even altitude or depth, for example. Files are referenced to the Earth using a coordinate reference system. In this case, the snow model files are in Albers conic equal area projection. Each pixel represents the value of a variable, for example, snow depth. And we know that each variable has attributes, like units, in this case, centimeters. For comparison, let's look at the parts of a NetCDF file. There are basically two parts to a NetCDF file, the header and a data part, all in one file. The header contains all the information about dimensions, attributes, and variables, except the variable data. The header is very important to NetCDF files. You may have heard the term self-describing for NetCDF. It's the header information that describes the file to all the software that reads it. Dimensions define the structure and record the length of the data array. For example, typical dimensions are latitude, longitude, time. Variables refer to the actual data in the array. Attributes provide details about each variable. And then the data part, which contains the actual data for each of the variables. Importantly, there are conventions or standards that help the NetCDF community share and access data. We follow the, we climate, follow the, the climate and forecast conventions. A link is provided on this slide. CF conventions refer to the rules of how to build and label NetCDF files, especially with regard to the header metadata content. The metadata provide a definitive description of what the data in each variable represents and the spatial and temporal properties of the data. Software that reads NetCDF is dependent on files following conventions. And conventions facilitate building applications with powerful extraction, regridding, and display capabilities. Now let's look together at the properties of the GeoTIFF file and the header of a NetCDF file for that snow data model I just shared. I'll spend some time with the details of this NetCDF header. The dimensions define the structure and the length of the columns, the rows and time. This defines the data array. We know there are 160 columns and 240 rows in this data. They are named X and Y, respectively, because these data are on a projected coordinate system. In the NetCDF file, the dimensions define the structure of the array, but each dimension will typically have a corresponding variable. You can see that down here with time, X, and Y as a variable. This is where the actual values for those variables are held. The variables are the actual data, not the data values. Remember, that's in the data part. Variables have attributes, which are details for each variable. Let's examine the snow depth variable. We see the type of data is float. Snow depth is mapped to, to three dimensions, time, y, and x. There are also a number of attributes associated with this variable. The fill value, which is undefined or missing data. There's also coordinates, grid mapping, long name, and units. One aspect of the NetCDF metadata is describing the coordinate reference system. To map this snow depth variable to the coordinate variable, this grid mapping attribute is essential. Remember that NetCDF files are self-describing. In order to create software that reads NetCDF files, there must be rules within the file in order to write that software. In a couple slides, I link to the website where the CF conventions are described. The 
The CF conventions around time are worth special attention. CF conventions specify that time values are relative to an original time and units is a required attribute. In our example, we have daily data starting on January 1, 2006. Time values will be referenced to this. We'll see this in the demonstration, and hopefully it will become clearer. And digging a little bit more into the header, you see that lat and lawn are variables in this file. This, this is part of the conventions for projected data sets. We'll see how to add these in the demonstration. In the CRS variable, we see all the necessary projection information for the elbers conic equal area projection. Finally, there is a section of global attributes that relate to, that relate to the data set at a more general level. It describes where it was produced, the project, contact information, et cetera. Needless to say, there's a lot of information in the header of a net CDF file. And let's not forget the data part. Here's a look at one time, one time step of, snow, of the snow depth variable from the data set we're looking at. These are the values of snow depth in centimeters. The transformation from thousands of GeoTIFF files to multi-band net CDF files and then to CF compliance may seem daunting. But fortunately for us, there are many software libraries that translate from one format to another and in the process populate many of the CF conventions that are important in file standardization. In our demonstrations, we'll use software that will convert GeoTIFF to NetCDF and then edit these files to CF conventions. The first we'll use the command line utilities called GDAL and NCO. These are very useful in dealing with file transformations and editing NetCDF files. And Jack will demonstrate the same functionality using Python with methods specific to file transformations and the Python NetCDF library. NASA's Panoply is a great tool to visualize NetCDF data. Jennifer, I will now uh, switch over to the demonstration of GDAL and NCO. So we're going to uh, run through using a, a Jupyter Notebook as a tool uh, transforming GeoTIFF series to a net CDF. I'll skip this background section uh, because we've already gone through what the data set is. But here's a look at the demonstration data. Like I said, the original GeoTIFF file contained two bands, snow depth and snow density. And snow depth will be the only variable that we're going to extract for this demonstration. This is an example of the original data, 365 files for the year 2006. And you can see they're labeled by the snow model name uh, and the year 2006, January 1st, January 2nd, all the way to uh, December 31st, so 365 files. A little bit about the software, GDAL and NCO. This demonstration is going to use a combination of both of those command line utilities. Uh, GDAL is a translation library for raster and vector geospatial data formats, and the two uh, standalone command line programs that we'll use are GDAL Info, which lists information about a raster data set, and GDAL Translate, which converts raster data between different formats. This is uh, an example usage of each of these uh, command lines, and remember, I'm, I'm using the uh, functionality of a notebook for uh, the use of the markdown and information within it, but we certainly would not run these uh, within a notebook. These are command line utilities, so you'd want to run these from the command line. NCDump is another command line utility that uh, generates a text representation of a specified NetCDF file, and we use this very often just to dump the uh, header file of a NetCDF, and we'll see that often in today's demo. 
And then uh, the NCO tools uh, compromise about a dozen standalone command line programs that operate on NetCDF files. These can be very powerful. In our GeoTIFF to NetCDF demonstration, we're going to make use of these five different NCO standalone utilities. And example usage, again, uh, we wouldn't actually do this in a notebook. We would do this command line. And once you get the command line figured out and you're all set, uh, you can then put those into a script file and run uh, all of these together. Uh, and that's a great way to keep track of the work that you do and how you did it. You have that as a, as a backup resource. All right, so let's use GDAL info on our, our original, one of the original net, or GeoTIFF files, sorry, to take a look at that uh, file and what it looks like from GDAL info. So if I run that, uh, GDAL info gives us information about a GeoTIFF file in this case, and you can see the projection information, you can see the size of this file, just like uh, from the, dem the slides that I shared. And also remember, there's two bands of information, band one and band two, and we're just interested in band one. And then I just want to share real quick uh, what NC dump looks like. If you use the dash H flag, uh, we're going to take a sneak peek at the final uh, NetCDF file that we create from these uh, hundreds of GeoTIFF files. I go ahead and run that. This dumps the header file for uh, this NetCDF, and you can see the time has 360. Uh, five time steps for the year, uh, the X and Y coordinates, and then all of the variables and attributes in CF compliance. Okay, moving on to the demonstration. So we're going to, uh, step one is extract the snow depth band from the GeoTIFF files. We're going to use the function GDAL translate, part of GDAL, part of the GDAL operators to extract the individual bands from a GeoTIFF file. And the dash B flag is uh, what will select the band that we're wanting to use. Now, throughout this demo, for the most part, to save processing time, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to demonstrate the use of these utilities on one band. And then I'm going to give you uh, scripts that will help you to loop through all of the bands of information. Because, of course, we're going to do the same thing to all 365 bands for the year. So back to this GDAL translate command that's going to extract band one. Uh, we're going to do it to the January 1st file, and then we're going to write out uh, another TIFF file with band one in the file name. So we'll go ahead and run that, and then just take a quick look at it using GDAL info, and you can see at the bottom here that we just have band one now in this GeoTIFF file. Again, you'll want to loop through all of those files to get all of band one. The second step, we're going to convert the GeoTIFF files to NetCDF, again using GDAL Translate. And uh, GDAL Translate has some powerful functionality with it, and we'll see that um, it will maintain the Elbers uh, equal area projection. And remember, we said that latitude and longitude are one of the uh, CF conventions that's required uh, with NetCDF files. And GDAL Translate has this great uh, creation option called write that long. And if you set that to yes, then latitude and longitude as a variable are going to be added to the NetCDF file that's generated. So we're going to go ahead and use that creation option. Again, I'm going to demonstrate this on one file, and then below that I'll have a script where you can loop through all of the files for this full year. So GDAL translate, uh, the dash OF is the output file format. We're going to write net CDF files. Uh, we're going to use the creation option for latitude and longitude. We're going to demonstrate this on January 1st, and we're going to write out a net CDF file. And we'll go ahead and run that. And then we're going to take a look at that uh, NetCDF file that we just created with ncdump. But what I'd like you to notice when we do open that, that x and y will be there as dimensions, as well as variables. So GDAL Translate writes that out for us. Uh, the two-dimensional latitude and longitude variables will be there. 
the file projection information is going to be there. And importantly, remember the CF compliance of needing the grid mapping name and grid mapping attribute associated with uh, band one in this case, which is this node depth band, uh, will all be there. Notice that this is going to be a two-dimensional file. We don't have a time dimension yet because we're going to have to uh, concatenate all of these files together once we run everything. So let's take a look at that one net CDF file that we ran using NC dump. Again, the dimensions are there, X and Y, and look at all that information that uh, GDAL Translate provided for us in the net CDF. We've got the uh, coordinate variables, X and Y as dimension, or variables, sorry, latitude and longitude as variables. And then band one, we're going to rename this, but this is the snow depth band. And again, here are our scripts in order to help you to do that to all of the files. Now, after looping through all files, you'll have 365 uh, 2D NetCDF files created from band one of the GeoTIFF files. And the next step is to put all those files together into one and add a time dimension. The first thing we're going to do is uh, go through a couple extra steps to get the uh, time dimension correctly named. So we're going to first start with NCO's uh, NC rename. And we're going to rename the variable Albers uh, the coordinate variable, that's Elber's conical equal area, and we're going to name it to CRS. And that stands for uh, Coordinate Reference System, which is more standardized. And it also allows uh, NCECAT, the NetCDF operator, that's going to put all these files together to correctly assign the time dimension. So we'll go ahead and run that. And take a look at the NetCDF file. And you can see that what we did was we renamed this, this variable uh, to CRS and all of the attribute information followed along with that. Once again, we need to do that for all files. And there's uh, a for loop to do that. And now we can finally merge the 365 individual files into, a net, into one net CDF file and add that time dimension. We're going to use an NCO operator called NCECAT to merge all of those files. Uh, when we do this, we're going to uh, use a combination of files that are going to exclude the CRS variable. It won't be written to the output file, but we can add that back in in a subsequent step. And this is going to keep the time and uh, coordinate reference variable in the correct places. The dash U option says to give the new record dimension the name time. So we're going to go ahead and run that. I have uh, a, a, a subdirectory with all of the bands uh, together, all of the individual net CDF files, so that we can uh, do this to the 365 files. So let's go ahead and run that. All right, and we'll take a look at it. And we'll look at, when we uh, do the NC dump on that, that we now have the three dimensions that we're looking for, time, y, and x. The time dimension is properly added and attributed to the band 1 variable. And the coordinate reference variable uh, is not copied, like I said, to the output file. So let's go ahead and look at that. Uh, like I said, here's time now added to that. We've got our 365 files all, all or time steps all in one file, and uh, most of the variable information. We're going to add the CRS variable back into this uh, multi-dimensional file using NCKS. Literally stands for NetCDF Kitchen Sync. It does all kinds of operators including uh, copying a variable from one NetCDF file to another. So we know that we have uh, the CRS variable in our individual NetCDF files, so we'll make use of that by putting it into uh, the multidimensional file that we just created. So we'll go ahead and run that and take a look at it. And there we go. 
have our coordinate reference variable. Do note, though, that the grid mapping variable, we're going to have to update that to the CRS uh, variable name, attribute name, um, so that that is properly referenced. All right. We don't have, we have time as a dimension, but we don't have time as a variable. So the next step is to add the time variable and time values. And the NetCDF or the NCO operator that does that is called NCAP2. Uh, and recall with, uh, with time, what we want to do is have that CF compliant. And to do that, we want to uh, do that as a numeric value with a, divine, a defined start time. And since we're doing a year's worth of data, the simplest thing is to uh, uh, define this as days since January 1st, uh, 2006. So let's look at this NCCAP uh, operator. And it actually uh, will put in a variable and fill in that array. You can fill in that array a, few, a couple of ways. One is that you can um, kind of just hard code it all in there. You can put 365 time steps. Um, and hit enter, and that will fill that array in. Now, notice that the time steps aren't uh, 1, 2, 3 for the days since January 1st. Instead, we start in the middle of the day, and that's, um, that, that's that time at noon, midday. So you can do that. Uh, you can hard code that variable, or you can uh, do it a little shorter, starting with the first, uh, the first time. Uh, the step for that time is one, and then filling in the rest of the array. The input file is our 365 uh, time step NetCDF file that we just created, and then we're going to write out a new file and give it uh, a, a new name with an underscore time. So we'll go ahead and run that and take a look at the output. And you can see now that we have time as a, or as a variable as well as a dimension. And here is that array of time that we just added. So that's how you can add data to a variable array. All right, a couple more steps. We're going to use uh, NC rename to change the variable band 1. We certainly don't want to call it band 1. We want it something more descriptive. So we're going to change it from band 1 to uh, snow depth. Remember, this was the 500 meter uh, resolution. And then we'll just dump that out all in one step. Go ahead and run that. And you can see here we have snow depth 500 meter. We renamed that variable. That's a really handy um, NCO utility. And another very, very handy NCO utility to get up to CF compliance is uh, NCATID. Uh, this edits variables and attributes, which is often necessary. You know, the GL Translate gets pretty close to a CF compliant net CDF file. Um, and sometimes you just might need to edit attributes and variable names. And NCCATID is very useful for that. So let's start by uh, updating the time variable. And we, once you have the hang of this uh, operator, it's, it's pretty easy and fun to use. Uh, this is the attribute we're updating. This is the variable for which we're updating. Uh, the mode, we're going to create it, and we're going to create it as a character. And that's described uh, in the, um, the link provided here. That gives a lot of information on all of these operators that I'm sharing today. Um, so we'll go ahead and add that. We're going to add all of these attributes to the time variable. Go ahead and run that and, and dump it out uh, with NC dump. And you can see now that we've got all those attributes associated with the time variable. And a little more editing. We're going to clean up this node depth variable and give it some better CF compliant information. We're going to uh, update the grid mapping name. We're going to give it a good long name and uh, make sure the units are there. That's very important. And then finally, we're going to update the global attribute section. Uh, like I said in the slides, this uh, is information for the overall file. 
uh, where it was made, who made it, uh, contact information. Uh, so that's important to have in these NetCDF files. So we'll go ahead and run that and take a look at it. And there we have the header of our CF compliant NetCDF file. So congratulations, you have created a CF compliant NetCDF file. Um, you're going to find these, uh, this information on our resources page. In a couple of days, we'll have this up and the, and the demonstration that, that, that Jack is going to share. And one useful tool is to um, take a look at these files in something like Panoply, uh, which is NASA's visualization tool. And this is where this file is located, way up in Alaska. Uh, let's put that on the correct projection. There we go. And we'll zoom into about three degrees. And there it is. There's our little NetCDF file that we just created. And you can see here that all of the time steps are there and the translation to the correct uh, day and time. All right, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack, who is going to give you a demo on Python. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I am going to pretty much do the same thing as Michelle just did in Python with uh, less detail. She covered that pretty thoroughly. So there's a lot of material in this notebook, as you can see from the table of contents here. Um, but it's well documented. You can come back and check it for your reference uh, as needed. So uh, the Python library for interacting with NetCDF is called NetCDF4. Uh, you can install it using either of these two commands, depending on which package manager you use. Uh, the package is maintained by Unidata, and it's very Pythonic. You'll find that writing NetCDF and reading NetCDF is very similar to just about every other uh, thing that you do in Python if you are a frequent uh, Python user. So before I get to the example, I'm going to show you real quick one of those ni nice uh, features about NetCDF that uh, I think is really cool. And we're going to access the file, the published version of the file that uh, Michelle just created. We're going to access it through our uh, thread server here at the ORNL DAC. It's hosted on threads, and it's accessible through the open DAP protocol. So run this, and we're going to get the header for the file straight from the web. <clears throat> so uh, what we did right there is just print the header that we can really easily access the data uh, by running this next cell. And that printed the array for the first time step of the snow depth variable. We can plot that with matplotlib. And you see that it looks just like the data that Michelle just showed you in Panoply. So that's the first time step of the file that, we're, that Michelle created and we're about to create again. It's important to always remember to close a file after you open it uh, in Python, especially if you're uh, writing multiple files in a single session. So we're going to do that. Now here are the uh, basics of using that CDF in Python. First, we're going to open a data set using the data set constructor. There's two arguments. There's the file name and the uh, mode. So we're opening this file in write mode and printing the empty header. And now just so I can show you an alternative method to open the file, we're going to close that and just verify that it's closed. Yes, this error indicates that I cannot print the header again. Um, this, uh, this is the alternative method I was talking about, and it's actually my preferred way of opening and closing NetCDF because it ensures that once you're outside of this with context that the file is closed and you don't have to worry about um, creating multiple files open at the same time. So you'll see by running this cell that that file is in fact closed because we can't close it a second time. So now I'm going to show you how to add data to uh, one of those files. We're going to start with a 4x4 four four array that represents a roster. Uh, it has values sequencing from 0 to 15, and we generated that array using NumPy. 
Next, we're going to open a data set just like we did before and give it two dimensions, X and Y. Both are size 4 because uh, we need two, four, two dimensions with size 4 in order to accommodate this array that we made up here. So run that and print the dimensions. You see it's stored as an ordered dict by default. Now we can add data to that, to, uh, now we can create a variable that exists along those dimensions. Uh, you use the create variable method of the data set constructor and it's uh, pretty simple also. You just give it the name of the variable, the data type, and then the dimensions that that variable uh, exists along. To run that and you see we have a new variable in here called my variable. Next, we can add uh, the array to the variable and then print that array as it exists inside the file. So you see we've added uh, the data to the my variable that's referenced with var and printed the array. So, it's, so we've put our data into the file now. Sometimes it's useful to give your data no data values when there are uh, you know, bad data for whatever reason in your uh, observation. So we're going to assign at position 2 along the x-axis, we're going to assign negative 9999 to all those values. Uh, that's pretty common, no data value that we use here at the ORNL DAC. To run that, and you see that the column here at X position 2, uh, Python is base 0 for indexing, by the way, is negative 9999. So um, now we can set the fill value for the variable to negative 9999 so we can see what, that, what effect that has. We actually have to close the original file and open a new one because uh, the fill value has to be specified when you create the variable. So run this, and it'll show you that following all the steps we've already covered, the fill value is masked by default uh, for you, and that can help in a lot of ways, particularly uh, the data size of your output. And now you pretty much know everything that you need to know to work through the demo of uh, writing the NetCDF, writing the NetCDF like Michelle did. So uh, close the file and NC dump what we just created, and this is the uh, sort of simple data set that we created in the steps above. Now let's make the geotiffs, uh, or now let's make the NetCDF from the geotiffs. First, we need to create a list of them uh, using glob. And here we printed the first five uh, from 2006. By the way, there's uh, only a couple packages that are required to do this. Please come and look back at this document, and the links to each of the packages are here uh, at the top. So uh, two pretty handy pieces of code I'm going to show you right here, but I'm going to kind of kind of jump through them. Uh, the time, first we need to create an array of values for time. Remember that they sequence from 0.5 to 365. And we do that by parsing the file names of the input. So just come back and check this out if you're interested in how to convert uh, strings to, to dates and this is the result for the first five files in our time series. Next, we are converting those dates to integers, or floats, excuse me. <laughs> and this is the value that we put in for day number five of the time series. So now we need to generate some arrays of coordinates, uh, x and y projected coordinates, and lat long uh, geographic coordinates. So we're going to do that by accessing the data from the first geotiff. We're going to get the columns, the rows, and the geotransform. And that's what you see right here. So the geotransform is really important. I've given you a little bit of an explanation of what, what the geotransform is here, but the gist of it is that uh, it tells GDAL how to position a roster on the plane of the projected coordinate system. So come back and check this out, and it'll explain pretty concisely how that works. Um, so here we're just going to generate a sequence of values that represent the x and y projected coordinates using the values that are in the geotransform. So you see the x minimum and the y maximum represent the origin of the input geotiff at the top left corner. And the resolution of each axis also, using that, we can generate the sequence uh, using NumPy. So run that. And you see here we've printed the first and last pixel of the array, and then the first five values for each. Now we need to reproject each of those to latitudes and longitudes. This time we need two-dimensional arrays, though. So we're going to start by getting 
a OSR spatial reference object. We're going to access that through the projection of the geotiff that's currently open, and we're going to create a PyProj transformation function that we can use to reproject all of the coordinates in those two arrays. So first you have to permute them so that there's two two-dimensional arrays of x and y coordinates, and then we pass those arrays to the transform function, and the result are these two-dimensional arrays of latitudes and longitudes. This is really handy. I use this snippet uh, just about every day, so uh, I put these annotations in here for your reference later. Remember to close the file, and now we're ready to actually write the output. So open a new one, again called my first net CDF. You see that it's empty. Add the four required dimensions. So this time there's an extra one called NV, and we use that to add a variable called time bound that's important to CF conventions. Uh, you can do your own reading about that, though. So add those to the file, and you see we have four dimensions now. We need to add the coordinate variables. We're going to start with time. Time has several required CF uh, attributes. We're adding those as well. Then we add the time bounds variable. This, the only requirement, is that it has the units uh, attribute. Then we're going to loop over each of the geotiffs and convert the strings of the file names to uh, dates and then to uh, values to insert into each position of time and time bounds variable. So we're looping over the files and adding the data uh, in the loop. Now we add the X and Y variables. They also have some required CF attributes. And we have to add the data from the arrays that we created up in the cell above, uh, at, up here in 4.2. And we print the X variable. Now add the latitude and longitude arrays. Uh, in the same way, they also have a few CF required variables. And that looks just like the cell above. This is what the longitude variable looks like after adding the data. Now we have to add the CRS variable. Uh, we can access each of the required projection parameters through that spatial reference object that we made above. Uh, and that's, you know, this looks pretty complicated, but it's really not. You just need to grab the value for each parameter and plug it in as an attribute to this dimensionless variable. And this is the result. This looks familiar to what you saw last time when Michelle was going through. Now we are going to quickly add the data. Uh, there, this also looks just like what Michelle produced. We have our variable name, the data type, the dimensions, compression. Uh, it, we tell it to compress the data and set the compression level and give it a fill value, and then add the attributes. So that variable is currently empty. The last thing we need to do is iterate over each of the geotiffs, open it, get the roster array, convert all of the missing values to negative 9999, and then add it to the position in the data variable that it should occupy and write the changes to the disk. So you see this loop actually is extreme. <laughs> this is really fast to do in Python. We just processed every single roster in the whole time series there. And finally, we need to add some global attributes and close the file and check the result with NC dump. And here is your final CF compliant that's CDF. Sorry for rushing through that, but uh, I'm happy to help you in any, any way I can the, uh, to do this on your own. The entire workflow that we just went through is right here as a script. It can do all of that over again for you in a couple seconds. And at this time, I will turn it back over to Jennifer. Thanks. OK, great. Thank you, Jack. And thanks, Michelle. At this point, what we'll do is we'll transition to a final set of polling questions. We'll give these about three minutes or so, um, given the time, and then we will transition to our Q&A session. So thanks to all of you. Let's give these a few minutes, and then we'll move directly into the Q&A.
Okay, everybody, we're going to give the question and answer period just another minute, and then we'll transition to the Q&A. There were actually quite a few questions that um, we received, so um, let's give this another minute or so. Okay, at this point, everybody, we are going to transition to the Q&A. Um, some of you may not have had an opportunity to uh, enter in your responses to the polling questions, but if you, I'll leave the virtual meeting space open when we are finished. Feel free to jot it into the Q&A, and we will follow up with our speakers offline. All right, so let's go ahead and the first question um, was actually quite a bit ago, and it was, is there any way to preserve band names in NetCDF instead of band one, band two, uh, or have the capability to write something like band one underscore um, snow depth, band underscore one underscore snow depth? Hi, Jennifer. Uh, that's a great question. Um, and I, I think that is, uh, the result of the GDAL translate uh, operator um, getting that from the GeoTIFF file. And so the NCKS, um, uh, or actually the NCO uh, rename is um, a, a great way. If that's the only operation you need to do, uh, that rename operator is a, is a good quick way to do that, to change variable name. Well, one, one last thing. Uh, Jennifer, if, so I believe, although I haven't tested this, I believe if you set the band description inside the GeoTIFF file, GDAL Translate is probably smart enough to copy that into the NetCDF when it converts it. Uh, but I can't promise you. OK, well, that's excellent uh, feedback. So one more thing. Uh, the short answer to that question is yes. Um, you have a lot of freedom to choose whatever variable names in NetSDF file, and you can use the tool that Michelle just mentioned, and to rename to just change the variable name to anything, like including the band number in the variable name. OK, well, thank you. Um, that was actually an additional panelist uh, from the Oak Ridge DAC, Dr. Yashing Wei, answering that question. The next question here is, uh, and I believe that the answer to this is that you will share the code. How can quite a few people asked about sharing the GDAL code and the Python code for processing the GeoTIFF files? And I believe you will share those, if not on GitHub, then, then on your learning page. But could one of you speak to that, please? That would be great. Yes, we will. We have on uh, the DAX website, there's a resources tab. And under that is a learning Hard, and all of our tutorials and webinars are available from that. They're searchable. Uh, so we'll have this uh, information up in a couple of days. Jack will keep his information as a Jupyter Notebook, uh, and that will be available through GitHub. Uh, I'm going to convert the notebook to a more of an HTML flavored page uh, for the GDAL and NCO information because I don't want to confuse people and have them running that through a notebook because it's not really the appropriate way uh, for GDAL and NCO. Um, but we'll have all of this available uh, just as soon as we can get it up in, in a couple of days. OK, thank you, Michelle. And just um, I have included the link to the learning page that Michelle was describing. 
Um, again, in the Q&A pod, um, particularly if you may have missed it earlier on, now you can see that in the question and answer pod. Um, let's move on to our next question here. Okay, so the question is, what are the sources of all these data are, okay, what are the sources of all these data are gathered together using PyScript, for example, and why the SNOW example? Which kind of other data could we gather as NetCDF files? I hope that I am rephrasing this appropriately for our participants. Yeah, I, I think I understand the question, and that's a really good question. We had to find something that um, we felt was a good example for uh, taking it, you know, from one file format, like thousands of geotiffs, into a NetCDF file, because the, the NetCDF was just more appropriate for that. That was simply a, an example data set, um, and that came from an original uh, uh, data uh, ingest uh, for our, our DAC. And any, any really series of GeoTIFF files, and it, it doesn't have to be snow, it can be anything that, you know, it has, uh, that has kind of a, a dimension to it, that like, the, like the, a time dimension or an altitude or ocean depth. You know, anything like that where it makes sense to combine those files into uh, a third dimension like time or depth um, are, are very appropriate. And these very same steps can be used for any data set like that. So that was an example data set that we worked through. And we'll have the, uh, just be, to be able to work through this as an exercise, we'll make those files uh, that we use available. Uh, to use with the tutorials. I hope that helps. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so the follow-up to this before we move on to the next question is: It means does that mean that any number of geotiff could be format geotiff files could be formatted as net CDF? Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, so, so Jennifer, I'll follow up. Uh, yes, but um, you know what? What we consider here at the DAC is: is it appropriate to do that? You know, does it make sense to make it a multi-dimensional data set? And sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Okay. Well, thank you for the additional clarification. The next question is: um, How? I'm curious roughly how large the resulting 365-day net CDF file is. Uh, give us a second and we'll check. It's uh, 23 megabytes, roughly. OK, thank you, Jack. Yeah, compressed. Uh, it's compressed at level 4 out of 9, so take that for what it's worth. <laughs> Okay. Now, will you, I think you already mentioned this, but you will also provide the code that we used for the GDAL uh, demonstration as well? Yes. Both, both okay. demonstrations will be available. Okay. Wonderful. Let's move on to our next question here, if you give me just one more moment. How do you compare HDF with NetCDF? Which format is used more often in NASA data sets? Uh, I guess I can say something about that. Um, uh, actually, with the most recent version of NetCF, which is NetCF version 4, any NetCF version 4 file is actually an, an HDF5 file. Um, so in general, the F HDF file format is um, more powerful, and it provides more features and flexibility for you to organize data. And NetCF, in my opinion, is a subset of the features offered by HDF. And NetCF is simpler to use. And if you do not have very complicated uh, data, like the remote sensing SWAT data, um, most of the time you may want to choose NetCF because of its 
uh, simplicity and the easiness to use. And actually, a lot of uh, NASA remote sensing products, so like MODIS products, um, VIRS, um, they are originally organized in HDF5 format. And depending on which research community, a lot of modeling community, um, they are using NetSDF. And I think NetSDF format is gaining more popularity recently. OK, thank you, Yashin. So give me just one moment here. There was a question that I um, do not. OK, I almost missed this one. It was, uh, are there any addition, any other GUI software for creating the NetCDF from GeoTIFF files that you might recommend? Uh, the GUI software is uh, has me thinking, and I know that um, although I don't have a lot of experience with it, you know, ArcGIS and ArcPro are getting much better at handling NetCDF, and I uh, am pretty sure that you can, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if export is the wrong is the right word, maybe transform, say, a GeoTIFF file, uh, and write that out as a NetCDF file within Arc Pro or and probably some of the later ArcGIS versions. Um, I'm not sure about open source software like QGIS. Anybody know? Well, QGIS leverages DDAL. Um, we are not aware of a perfect GUI interface that you can easily uh, convert GOT to NetSDF. Uh, like Michelle mentioned, Arc GIS, you can export a raster uh, data layer into a NetSDF. But uh, beyond that, you don't have much control. If you want to fine tune um, the structure and the um, metadata that you want to store in NetCF, you probably have to go with either um, the NetCF operator tool or um, any Python or Java or any other NetCF library by writing some code. Or MATLAB, or R. OK, thank you, Yashing. Um, let me move on to the next question here. OK, does, do NetCDF tools, can they take advantage of a high performance computing cluster? Um, definitely, yes. Um, so in this webinar, we uh, didn't provide um, information on like the parallel I.O. or use cases on how you can use NetSDF library on a cluster. But there are a lot of other uh, resources available um, online, and we can actually share some of the resources with you. For example, the Unidata, or the creator of the NetSDF library, offers a lot of uh, materials uh, on how to use the parallel I.O. with NetSDF. Um, and uh, we know at Oak Ridge National Lab, we have uh, quite a few um, supercomputers. I think the world's fastest uh, supercomputer is located here. There are a lot of um, uh, research groups, especially the modeling groups. They run um, their models producing and using NetSDF data files on the um, supercomputer here. Definitely the answer is yes, and there are resources available. Okay, thank you, Yashin. Um, let's see here, moving down. All right. Can NetCDF be used for 3D data, such as uh, last files from LIDAR? Any examples? I'm not aware of any examples of people storing LIDAR data in a NetCDF file. Um, I imagine you could do it, but I do not think personally that that, that it's the appropriate format. Uh, Yashing might have other ideas. Well, technically, you can store a three-dimensional data in like a point cloud in NetSDF format because you basically store each individual point, and that point has 
latitude, longitude, and um, maybe altitude, uh, you can basically add any uh, dimension to that point. But technically, it's possible. But like Jack said, um, NetCF may not be the ideal format for that kind of data. Um, so that depends on that particular use case. So choosing the right format is not just based on whether it's possible or technically possible. We also need to consider the amount of efforts you need to invest on putting data into that format and also the target audience that your data will be used. Um, that's also a very important factor. OK, thank you for your uh, response. Um, the next question is, why are NetCDF categorized into NetCDF3 and NetCDF4? Um, like I just mentioned, NetCDF is gaining more and more popularity. Um, many reasons. One reason is NetCDF format itself has been improving significantly, and we strongly um, suggest you to use NetCDF4 against the NetCDF3, because NetCDF4 is the most recent version that has a lot of advantages compared with the older version 3 um, um, NetCDF format. Um, for example, those advantages include with NetCDF4, you can apply internal compression. So like the file size that Jack created um, that combines all 365 days of data together it resulted uh, with a data file uh, with the size of like 23 um, megabytes. It's pretty small because it's internally compressed. So when you see the file, it's still an SDF file, but inside the file, uh, some compression algorithm has been done to reduce the file size. And that's transparent to you. You don't have to worry about like uncompress or decompress it before using. You can just use it right away, and the compression and decompression will happen on the fly, and you probably will not be aware of that at all. Some other uh, advantages include um, you can um, divide a uh, NetCDF file in version 4 into uh, many, many small chunks inside the file, and that will increase the performance significantly, and that also a feature that um, helps the parallel I.O. to uh, improve the performance of accessing the writing SDF file uh, significantly. And some other advantages include, like, you can um, include groups um, of variables and the groups of groups and inside an SDF file. So you basically have more flexibility of organizing data in, in an SDF file. So a lot of benefits with the version 4 compared with the older version of version uh, NetCF, version 3. And I'll just add one thing that I, I took out of my demo and I'll put back in when I post it, just for the sake of time today. Um, there is a utility called NC Copy, and it does exactly that. It'll convert from NetCDF uh, 3 to NetCDF 4, and while you're doing that, you can apply a compression and other aspects of the advantages of NetCDF4. Uh, that's a very good point. It just reminded me that um, NetCDF4 comes with a number of um, data models. And uh, one of those data models is called uh, version 4 classic. And the version 4 classic model, the only difference between the version 3 is you can apply like internal compression. You can do chunking with your data. Well, it still keeps the same, exact the same structure uh, internally with the old version 3 format. OK, thank you very much. I just wanted to, there are quite a few more questions um, that we have not answered yet. So if we don't get to it during the Q&A, I will be forwarding the uh, Q&A log along to our speakers, and they will be able to follow up with you offline. Um, the next question is, is there, is there something similar to CF conventions for HDF? And forgive me if that's already, I may have missed that answer, if it has already been addressed. 
Um, so the only thing I can say is I'm aware of uh, some working groups within NASA's ESDSWG um, talking about borrowing um, some elements from the CF convention and put them into HDF. Um, we can find out and share some resources um, afterwards. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, can net CDF be opened in SNAP? We're all kind of wondering what SNAP so, is, so maybe so we So I believe know. this is actually a tool suite for Sentinel data that the European Space Agency has put together. I'm not sure, Pala, if I have that correct. Because wow, I that's know a great that Sorry, Jennifer. I said I was going to say that's a great question, and uh, we're just not familiar with it. But we can certainly look into it and get back to the person who asked that. Okay, great. Thank you, um, Michelle. Let's see. I'm just cycling through to see if we have. We've got only a couple more minutes here for questions. Uh, how can we download downscale? I'm. CMIP 5 NC data using R or GDAL? Um, I think that um, question itself is a kind of research topic. Uh, I'm not sure what kind of variables you're talking about and what kind of uh, regrading measure um, you're looking for. Uh, if you just want to do like um, simple regrading measure, um, like a nearest neighbor or bilinear, uh, cubicle average, you can just run GDAL and choose whatever the target resolution you want the data to be, and your data will be um, resampled or downscaled. But I know a lot of um, research groups, they uh, look for um, optimized the specific um, downscaling approaches for their particular data. Um, so it, this really depends. Okay, I think we have time for only one more question. I don't think I have missed any. There have been some participants who've provided some really excellent feedback for other participants here. Um, are there any additional questions at this time? And I wanted to draw your, while we're um, waiting to see if there might be another question, let's see here. Um, I did want to mention to everybody that today's presentation file is available for download as a PDF in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If you highlight that file, you'll be prompted with an option to download the file. And again, the recording will be um, the recording will be made available within a couple of days, both as a direct link and as a YouTube link. <clears throat> okay, and so there was a follow-up. Snap will open both at NetCDF and HDF. So thanks, Byron. Yeah, thank you. All right. If there are no additional questions, then at this point what we'll do is we'll leave the virtual meeting space um, open for another 10 minutes or so, and we will log off from the audio component. Um, and there has been an inquiry about whether or not there are other webinars that address Python programming for processing satellite uh, data. Yes, we have over 100 data access and discovery webinars that have been posted to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel. I'll type that link in um, to, the, to the pod in just a moment. Not all of those uh, webinars uh, specifically address Python programming. However, there are quite a few that do work it into their, um, into their live demonstrations, particularly in processing uh, land data and other data products. So I would recommend um, you know, taking a look at those, those webinars, and uh, you can certainly follow up with me offline via email if you have more specific discipline questions. And I'd like to thank, oh, this is the final question, then we're going to log off. Are you considering using X-Array to handle NetCDF files in Python? Uh, yeah, in-house we do use X-Array uh, to handle NetCDF, um, and that, that's a really powerful um, 
method for dealing with uh, NetCDF files. So yeah, we encourage that. Okay, with that final question, I'd like to thank all of you for your participation today, and I'd like to thank our speakers as well as Dr. Yashin Wei, and we hope to see you at an upcoming webinar. All right, thank you, everybody. Goodbye now. <laughs>